You can turn in your Bibles to the third chapter of Hebrews. Good morning, good to see you all. In a moment, I will read two texts from Hebrews. Bear with me until we arrive at that point. Why don't you pray with me? Father, already today we have known a measure of grace that comes to us through the divine mediator, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we long to return a gift of worship, a gift of praise, a gift of heartfelt sincerity, a gift of really hearing and obeying the Word. Would you work such things in us that are pleasing in your sight today? Would you give ears to hear? We love you. We commit this time to you. And we ask your abundant blessings to be upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. Be at peace. Bear burdens. Avoid grumbling. Accept each other. Prefer others. Love genuinely. Outdo others in showing honor. Hate evil. Do good. Resist the devil. Pursue righteousness. Put away childishness. Show hospitality. Be generous and share. Pray without ceasing. Rejoice with the rejoicing. Weep with the weeping. Live in harmony. Take no vengeance. Cling to what is good, serve, sacrifice, devote yourselves, show mercy, be patient, admonish, encourage, bear with the weak, put away boasting, imitate the mature, keep short accounts, endure hardships, rejoice in the truth, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, and let all that you do be done in love." Amen. Quite a sermon. These things make up just a small fraction of New Testament commands to pastors of churches. That sound right to everybody? Did, did I miss something, Matthew? What, I, I may have messed that up. Let, let me correct that statement. These things make up just a small fraction of New Testament commands to mature members of churches. No, Jennifer says no. Twice in a row I've got this thing wrong. Okay, let me give it, let me give it a third try. Let me give it a third try. Bear with me. It was one of the commands. These things make up just a small fraction of the New Testament commands to all believers in every church at all times. I got it right. That was it. Michael, nod of approval. Matt claps. Woo! The Spirit of God is with me. Well, now that we have it right, let me ask you, how does the vehicle of your life in this church, for those that are members here, how does the vehicle of your life measure up to that 36-point inspection. I think only the arrogant would reply, I pass all 36 points. I doubt anybody's going to do that this morning. As a matter of fact, each and every one of us, if we seriously considered that abbreviated list I set before us, could identify areas where we are weak, even neglectful. And we should recognize these areas of neglect or weakness or selfishness. 
Because only then, by God's powerful and transformative grace, only then, by the working of God's Spirit within us, can we change and grow and behave toward one another more and more Christ-like, more and more unselfishly. Dear ones, let me ask you this morning, what are you living for? What are you living for? Maybe the better question would be, who are you living for? Who are you living for? You you want to say Christ immediately. That's the gut reaction, I think, of nearly everybody in this room. But you have to understand something. To live for Jesus Christ is to live for the good of those that he bled, suffered, and died for. So, So if I ask the question again, who are you living for? Maybe you approach it a little bit more cautiously. Are you living for those Christ suffered and died for? Are the brothers and sisters of this local church a priority to you? Not the ones you you really like only. Not the ones who are always generous with you pouring into your life. I mean all of us. The entire body of believers here, are they corporately on the radar of your heart? Do you pray for these? Do you exhort them? Do you support the members of this body in real, tangible, felt, knowable, visible ways? These are questions I want you to consider this morning as we open the scriptures together. Because the alternative is is ugly and unbiblical and sub-Christian. And that would be that you're here merely to have your needs met. Uh, that, That you're here to get this weekly fix of fellowship and preaching and singing. Dear sister, dear brother, would you please honestly assess yourself this morning? Let's be real. Whether you've been here for 10 weeks or 10 years or longer, can you say that your contribution to the life and health of this body is a true gift of worship worthy of Christ's suffering on your behalf? Can you answer that in the affirmative? These are tough questions. I know it. But but if we can't be honest with each other, then where on earth can we be honest? We're we're children of God. We're we're people who rejoice in the truth. We're we're family. We're saints here. If, If we can't be honest, where in the world can you be honest? So, my challenge to you today is that you make this morning, this day, a day of confession, of repentance and renewal. Make make fresh commitments this morning to God Almighty in the midst of your life in this body and your ministry to this body. For many of us, I think this morning, if handled rightly, it could feel almost like a renewal of vows for a couple that's been married for a number of years. And then they say, let's, you know, it's 10 years, Let's, let's renew our vows in celebrating 10 years of marriage. Maybe some of you need to renew your vows, so to speak, with this local church. Well, by the grace of Jesus Christ, I am here this morning to urge you to do whatever you must do so that you can live in a way that is visibly meaningful here in this body, so that you can be all out for your brothers and sisters, ultimately for Christ's sake. Now again, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 3. I want to read two texts, one here in Hebrews 3 and one in Hebrews 10, and these will serve as something of our guide this morning. Hebrews 3, a single verse, verse 13, this is the Word of God. May it be living and active among us. But exhort one another every day. As long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
Now turn with me to Hebrews 10. Jeff wonderfully exposited Hebrews 3.13 some weeks ago now. If you did not hear that, you should go to Sermon Audio and listen to it this week. I will not need to do that this morning, but rather, hopefully, devotionally exhort you from a text on exhortation. Now Hebrews 10, and I'm not intending to steal Jeff's thunder many months from now, but here we are, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This morning, brothers and sisters, we're going to camp out on the theme of discipleship. And from the outset, I want to establish my working thesis statement. And here it is. Disciples should be both discipled and discipling. I'll I'll repeat that. Disciples should be both discipled and discipling. I said it last week. I'll say it again. We really do need each other. We really need each other. As disciples of Christ, we, we need each other. No such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. We need each other. We, we get the English word for disciple from the Latin word, disere, which means to learn, to get to know, or to become familiar with. A disciple, then, is a learner, but not one with his nose crammed in books all day. Rather, it would almost be more appropriate to say a true disciple is something like an apprentice. It's, it's far more hands-on than merely black words on white paper. A disciple, then, is to stay close to the teacher. Think of the four Gospels that we cherish in the living Word of God. A disciple, then, is to stay close to his teacher and follow, imitate, observe, learn, and understand all that he can. In listening, in watching the life, this is what disciples do. Well, straight away in the Gospels, Jesus begins to surround himself with disciples, doesn't he? And isn't it significant and even amazing that he surrounds himself with 12? Right? The Son of God, the the perfect man, the God-man, the one that worshipped the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength continually and perpetually, he chose only 12 So please don't think you're going to suddenly disciple 50 or 150 people. The Lord chose 12. And he did that almost right out of the gate in his earthly ministry. Well, as a Christian, you are one called to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or as Revelation 14.4 puts it, a forever and ever follower of the Lamb. In reality... This call to discipleship is a rather radical thing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it this way, when Christ calls a man, y'all have heard this quote, I'm sure, he bids him what? Do you remember? Come and die. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That, That sounds kind of radical. That might shake somebody. Well, the Lord Jesus is no less alarming in his approach. I'll read from Luke 14. Verses 25, 6, and 7, and then verse 33. Now, great crowds accompanied him, Jesus, and he, Jesus, turned and said to them, I want you to hear what Jesus says to the crowd, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He goes on, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. 
And, and he goes on. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Three statements, almost back to back to back. And Jesus is very cut and dry, very clear to the crowds. He's going to thin the ranks of those that would really consider following him. Brothers and sisters, church today, I think we have lost our edge. We, we want Christ and the beauty of this glorious Christ, but we want it without the commitment and the cost. We, we want the crown, we don't want the cross. But Jesus is so clear. Discipleship is costly. If you're going to commit to follow him, it will cost you something. And in Luke 14, he's radically clear. Radically clear. What you once held to your chest as nearest and dearest in your life, it must take second place to Christ. And a distant second place at that. Your loyalty, your love for Jesus must dominate everything else about you. Everything else about you. This is what it means to be a disciple. Not a super disciple. Not a tier one disciple. But most of us, you know, we're like tier six or seven disciples. No, there's, there's just disciples and that's why I titled the message this morning, Discipleship, colon, Ordinary Christianity. We're not talking about super Christians this morning. We're talking about disciples of Christ, dominated by love and loyalty to Jesus Christ. Dear ones, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? You know, based on this criteria, the very things we've read this morning, are you... Really, a disciple of Christ? It's a fair question. Does Jesus have absolute priority in your life? Or is he somewhere down the list? This is exactly what this gracious Savior demands of you and me. Now, there is much that could be said about the Christian life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. But for the sake of time, I want the focus to be far more narrow this morning. So I have broken the remainder of the message up into three parts. Number one, you've been called. Number two, called to preserve. And number three, called to promote. I'll make more sense of those statements shortly. For the sake of time, let's begin where our Christian life begins. You've been called. When you and I first believed the gospel, you and I were signing up for something far greater than salvation. Now, that may have been our focus at the time. That certainly was a part of our prayer, Lord, save me. But whether you knew it or not, whether you fully understood it at the time or not, you were signing the rights to your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you were giving it all up to him. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. That's the way Paul puts it, you're not your own. It, it, it didn't just come to you as salvation from sin or pardon and forgiveness of sins. No, no, you, you gave the whole thing up. You gave your life to Jesus Christ. You committed to love him and live for him all the way until the day that he takes you home to forever be with him. That's what you signed up for. And thus instantaneously... You were transformed that moment into a disciple. A baby disciple, no doubt, but a disciple from the get-go. 
You, you instantaneously, in conversion, became a follower of the Lamb. You instantaneously became a soldier of Christ, a, a missionary and a witness, a self-denying, cross-embracing, ready-to-be-martyred Christian. That's what happened in conversion. The call is big. It's really big. The call as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And the call to this cruciform or cross-bearing life, it's pervasive. It's not for a select few. As Christians file into the kingdom of God, day after day, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, Christ is not there standing at the gate calling out the cream of the crop Christians who will live selflessly and sacrificially. No, not at all. This extends the call of discipleship to every believer in every age. If you are in Christ today, this call to come and die, it's your calling. Again, Jesus says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, an instrument of torture, the height of earthly suffering, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus doesn't just ask for a lot. He actually doesn't ask at all. He demands absolutely everything from you and me. He demands it. He deserves it. But he demands it. The Christian life is costly. It really is. Jesus wasn't being dramatic when he urged his hearers that day, hey, you, just, just sit down a minute and count the cost. H hold on. Hold on. I know, you, I know you see some things you like right now, but buddy, you need to sit down and count the cost. Such demands, when we read a section of Luke's gospel, like the 14th chapter, they can feel abrasive. They, they can turn people off, and boy, ever did they. That's exactly what they did. You, you could just picture it. Some inquirers that had gathered around the Lord Jesus that day. It was a great crowd. They, they heard all this talk about hating family members and, and giving up everything. And they stomped away in disgust. Oh yeah, it happened big time. The crowd suddenly dwindled and nearly disappeared. But there were others, maybe just a few. And they heard him say these almost crazy things. Hating wife and children and mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. Renouncing everything. And yet they were so compelled, so attracted, so drawn to the Lord Jesus and his gospel. They saw him suddenly as exceedingly precious. No matter what pains and cost would, would come from following him. And they said, I'm... I'm going after that man. I'm, I'm willing to give it all up. I've read the fine print and I'm in. They looked into his loving eyes and felt within this themselves, I will follow this Christ wherever he takes me. This is what it means to be a disciple. To say in your heart of hearts there, is nothing I would not do for that man. There is nowhere I would not go. This is what it means to be a disciple. Have you, beloved, experienced this yourself? Are you, this morning, a committed Christian? You've read the fine print and you're committed still. You've suffered in your journey and you're committed still. And you are determined with every fiber in your being to be faithful to the end. God helping you. Are you a committed Christian? If not, praise be to God, Jesus is a welcoming Savior to needy sinners. 
Today is the day of salvation. Come to Jesus Christ. Bow before him. Believe him. Embrace him. Lay down your life at his feet. Turn from your sin. Be born again. Today is the day. But if you are a committed Christian, then listen well. This call is your call. This call to come and die. If you're in, you remember what I said last week, be all in. If you're in, be all in for Christ. If you're in, be all in for the bride of Christ. No excuses. Be all in. Number two, called to preserve. You're called, you're called to preserve. Look with me at Hebrews 3.13. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. When, when you think, brother, sister, when you think of your role in this body as one of its members, do you think of yourself as a preservative? Not, not like peach jam or something. I mean a preserving influence in the life of this local church. Do, do you consider yourself to be a preservative? You should. You, you really should. Simply put, there, there are some things worth fighting for, worth fighting to preserve in the life of a church. We could scour the New Testament and come up with a long list, but here's a short list. Unity, Ephesians 4. You, you've got to fight to preserve unity right here, right now in this body according to Ephesians 4.3. What about love, charity? Uh, you're going to read 1 Corinthians 13. You, you ought to feel compelled. I, I've got to stand for this. This is what I've got to preserve right here, right now. Holiness. That's it's in our text, isn't it? Hebrews 3.13. Exhorting one another. Every day, as long as it is called today. Why? So that none of you, none of us, may become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. There are things that are worth fighting for. You are called to be a preserving influence in this body if you're in this body. And the text tells us, exhort one another every day. That's quite an exhortation, isn't it? Exhort one another every day. The word exhort means to urge, strongly encourage, advocate, admonish. Those are some synonyms that will help us get the sense of the word's meaning. It's, it's an up-close and personal appeal. Man to man, woman to woman, believer to believer, an up-close and personal appeal. In this case, it's a personal appeal to forsake sin, not become hardened, pursue holiness. Beloved, as Christians, as members of this body, you are called and commanded right here in the text to exhort one another and to do it as often as is needed, even up into every day. That's what the text says. Your neglect of this responsibility or obligation to your brothers and sisters in this local church family only contributes to others around you becoming hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. This is what the text is saying. Your, your timidity, your self-interest, your self-love, your self-preservation, your standoffishness, does positive harm in the life of this body. If all of us lived to be the preserving influence we're called to be, can you imagine the impact that it would have on this church? Can you imagine? Look at the word, exhort. I want you to see how the very nature of the word epitomizes discipleship. Exhort one another. The compound word gives the sense of coming alongside someone, taking them by the hand, urging them forward. Let's make progress. 
The connotation is that you're advocating for them with feeling. Much like our Savior advocates for us, right? Mac cited the text this morning, 1 John 2, 1. If anyone sins, or but when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. In the same way that Christ advocates for us and comes to us when we sin with special ministry to us, so we are to be brothers, sisters to each other. That's what families do. Now, do you remember my thesis statement? Disciples should be both discipled and discipling. If you've been called by Christ and are now in Christ, you are a disciple of Christ. And if you're a disciple of Christ, you are to be discipled by others and also, even at the same time, discipling others. That's a little bit of an expansion on my thesis statement. Now, take my thesis and apply it to Hebrews 3.13. The call to you as a disciple of Christ is to receive exhortation in a way that frees you from the bondage and deceitfulness of sin and also to exhort others yourself so that they're not snared by sin. Do you see that? It's a two-way street. So, so on Monday, you may be exhorted to come out of sin's snare, and on Tuesday, you may be exhorting a brother to do the same. That's how church life works. It's, it's not like you're the disciple that's always snared, and Alan's the disciple that's never snared. No, that's, that's not how it works. Alan will be snared at times. He'll be tricked, trapped, and so will you and I. So one day we are discipling and encouraging, admonishing, exhorting, coming alongside a brother, helping him off the ground, and then the very next day we may be the one lying on the ground needing help. And thus we need to be discipled. Part of discipleship is this every day advocating and admonishing, giving and receiving. Well, you, you may be thinking and hearing this, <laughs> Brother Lee, I, I don't think I'm in a place to disciple anybody. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? If you're a Christian, you're in a place to be discipling somebody. So stop thinking that way. Instead, think biblically. It, it doesn't have some exemption clause here in verse 13 that, oh, if, if you're a babe in Christ, just sit down, shut up. Don't be exhorting anybody. I, I, di I didn't see that here. But rather, the admonition to the church is exhort one another every day. So, based on a text like this, if you identify a brother or sister that isn't seeing sin's trap, that isn't seeing how Satan has laid a snare in their path. You, seeing it, are suddenly something they need. So exhort one another. Be that preserving influence. That is part of discipleship. And discipleship in the Bible is a community affair. A family affair. To disciple someone... You don't need certificates, nor do you need seminary degrees. You simply need a Christ-like love for your brothers and sisters and courage to serve them. Courage to say the thing, to be a real brother or sister to them. You simply need something that they don't presently have. Are you hearing me? You, you want to disciple someone? You need something that they presently don't have. You, you need to be a little bit further down the road in Christian maturity and growth in grace. A little bit. You, you need to know just a little bit more about the gospel, about scripture than they do. Just a little bit. You need to be able to see something that they can't presently see. And we all have blind spots. This happens all the time. This is how you disciple. You don't have to be a pastor 
to be one who disciples men or women. You just have to be a little further down the road. Thus, the man in Christ for one or two years has plenty to offer the newborn Christian. The woman with two young children sitting next to her in church on Sunday morning has plenty to offer the first-time mother. The brother that sees another brother in the body chasing too hard after success in his business career He's got to be a brother to that brother. He's got to exhort him and warn that brother. He's seeing something that brother may not be seeing. This is what it means to disciple. When two of you sisters after the meeting concludes today and you're outside there in the beautiful weather talking and one of you begins to describe the difficulties of the week and the hardness of child rearing, listening sister, you've got an opportunity to disciple It's time for you to advocate. It's time for you to encourage. That's how real and everyday this kind of discipleship is. Now all of these imply some kind of relational depth. Thus if you're on the fringe, you're not going to be able to disciple anyone. You're not going to be able to invest in anyone's life. So get off the fringe and be all in if you're going to say you're in. And all of this is a part of the New Testament call to every single believer. How are you doing, dear ones, as a preserving influence in this local body? How is it with you? When was the last time you offered loving correction? When one of us was grumbling. When was the last time you ever corrected grumbling? Unless it was your kid. When was the last time you hugged someone and offered solid encouragements, seeing that they're struggling with sin? We could go on and on here, couldn't we? How would you assess your preserving influence in this body? Another note, I've already kind of mentioned it, but I want to emphasize it just a little further. I have a strong sense in looking at Hebrews 3.13 that the divine author behind Hebrews was very purposeful in choosing his words. Exhort one another every day. Five powerful words. Brothers and sisters, what's the point? Why the every day? This is to be Entirely ordinary. Ordinary. I'll mention this a little further next week when we're talking about church discipline. This is ordinary Christianity. Ordinary. Not not so rare that when you exhort someone, it comes off as something startling or shocking. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Not, Not so rare that it's awkward unexpected. No, this should be the norm among us. This should be the everyday stuff of church life, the everyday stuff of loving relationships with real brothers and sisters here. People that you know, people that you pray for, people that you think of throughout the day, throughout the week. Will you freshly commit to fulfill your call here to preserve. Will you? Three. Called to promote. You are called. Called to preserve. And lastly. Called to promote. Hebrews 10. Turn, turn to that text with me. Verses 24-25. And let us consider. How to stir up one another. To love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day, the Lord's day. The day of his wrath. The day that he wraps this whole thing up and takes us home to heaven. Now, on one hand, 
right here. We, we want to be a preserving influence in the body that shuts some things down. That's, that's what an exhortation would be intended to do, to keep that brother, that sister, out of the pitfall of sin that confronts them. We, we want to shut that kind of stuff down lovingly as brothers and sisters. On the other hand, we want to be promoting influences that stir some things up. And that's what we see in the text here in verse 24. So what are we called to stir up? Love, good works, togetherness, body life, not neglecting, being together, and encouragement. Those are the four things that these two verses name. Now, if you were to honestly assess your life in this body, what is it you are promoting? What are you promoting? Are you promoting anything? What would someone that is beginning to know you well or already knows you well look into your life and say, ah, I, I know this about Stephen. I, I know this about Brother Mac. As committed Christians in covenant community, we want to be those that promote everything that is good and godly. If it's the case that in the last days, according to Matthew 24, the love of many will grow cold, we then, for each other, together, need to be constantly stoking the embers of love in each other's hearts, do we not? To stir them up, to love. That was the first thing the author named. If, if threats to idleness, if sloth is a real temptation in our day, if, if leisure has a firm grip on the American church, then, then what? We need to be continually provoking one another to holy activity and good works. That's the second thing mentioned in these two verses. It's the picture of taking a fellow believer by the hand and saying, come with me, let's run. Stirring one another up. It's holy provocation, not irritation, but joyful stimulation. That's what we see in this text. Because we simply cannot be found standing still in the Christian life. Time is too short, Satan is too diligent, sin is too deceitful. How many of us could testify to seasons of life where we just felt dull? Maybe there are some here today that just feel dull. What a mercy then would it be for a brother or sister to come alongside you with warm encouragements that would stir you up to joyful activity once more, to sharpen you, to stimulate love and good works in your life. I mean, if we are poor and needy, and the Bible tells us multiple times we are, if we are poor and needy pilgrims walking through a dry and weary land, think of this Old Testament imagery, how much more do we need this kind of regular ministry in our lives? How much more do we need one another to stir each other up? And how much more should you and I be this kind of stimulating force for righteousness, for holiness, for the Lord Jesus himself, for the needy ones in our midst? And let me remind you, one day you'll be the needy one. And the next day you'll be helping the one in need. This is discipleship. The essence, I think, of Hebrews 10, 24, 25 is that picture of healthy body life. That's what I think we see. After all, he begins the admonition in verse 24. Also, you see it at the beginning of verse 23 with let us. Again, taking them by the hand and leading them into this kind of holy progress. Beloved, are you giving yourselves to this kind of holy activity, this kind of stirring up, brethren, to love and good works? Is this what you're promoting? 
Will you freshly commit this morning to Christ and on a horizontal level to your brothers and sisters to do this more and more and consistently and intentionally because this is what you've been called to, church. Right here, right now, this is your ongoing day-by-day commitment to this body. If you're going to be in, be all in according to Scripture. Look around. This, this is your church family. Y- y'all that know me, you, you know all my family members are dead. My spiritual family means so much. And you are worth laboring for. You are worth sacrificing for. But won't you see this? And lay your lives down for one another. If you're not investing, you're neglecting. If you're not discipling, you're disobedient. This is what the word says to you today. So, will you repent of your self-centered neglect and ask God to fill you with love for these Will you? Will you pray to be increasingly used by Christ in the very ways we've talked about today, preserving and promoting? We we so appreciate and adore Christ, whoever lives to intercede for us, don't we? Oh yes, Hebrews 7. Love that text. Can't wait till Jeff gets to Hebrews 7. We, we often feel that we need, desperately need, Christ's continual ministry to us. Shepherding and guarding and keeping and loving. We, we pray for it. We praise Him for it. We feel our constant need of it. Let Christ's commitment to you be the living and perfect example you then imitate in your relationship to one another. You need each other. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where our Christ-centered theology grows legs and begins to walk. Prove your love for Christ by loving one another. Serve the living Christ by serving one another this week. Bring joy to Jesus Christ by bringing joy to your brothers and sisters. This is how ordinary Christianity works. Invest in one another. Be in each other's lives. I mean, get up close and personal with one another. Take responsibility for fellow believers here. Act like you're the family the Bible soundly and rightly declares you are. Suffer together, laugh together, worship together, labor together, weep together, sing together, be together. Preserve and promote. Prioritize another. Prefer your brother, your sister, even before yourself. And the great shepherd of the sheep will establish you. And according to Hebrews 13, 21, he will equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, my one request this morning is that you would take this body, my brothers and sisters, to new and higher ground as it pertains to our love and care 
for one another. Let us say, not in a whimsical way, not in merely a hopeful way, but with real feeling, I am willing to spin and be spent for these. Work this in us, Lord, by your mighty power. In Jesus' name we pray.